On today's episode of The Mighty Oak Show, Chad and I have a conversation about socialism and its implications, not only politically, but socially, and probably more important, morally. And what does that mean to our, not only economy, but what does that mean to us as individuals and as a nation? And we had a great conversation about that, followed by that conversation with a discussion and an interview with Gene Cook. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. Mighty Oak Show, where every week we provide a biblical worldview on military and current events. And we've got an exciting show for you here today. And uh, excited about our guest in just a few moments. But before we get there, looking forward to having a conversation with the president and founder of the Mighty Oaks Foundation, Chad Rove Show. Chad, welcome to today's show. Hey, what's up, guys? So today, our um, biblical worldview on military and current events, we have a current event that intersects both, and that makes it easy for us, I guess, because we can talk about uh, both things at the same time. But uh, this weekend, uh, our president said that uh, he may or may not, and uh, in, in classic uh, President Trump fashion, he might or might not, we don't know, but uh, he talked about the problems that are going on in Venezuela, the uh, incredible unrest in the country of Venezuela and all that's happening there, and said he may commit troops to try to bring some peace there, if nothing else, to provide humanitarian assistance. And for anyone who's watching the news and following world events, the happenings in Venezuela um, are something that you're aware of. But a very interesting uh, situation there. Venezuela, of course, over the last many years has been probably the wealthiest nation in South America. Hugo Chavez has been the president or was the president for a number of years. And even though he acted as a socialist dictator, is very much a socialist country, he imposed government controls on labor and on production, uh, even though he did that, and, and socialism is something we'll talk about here in just a moment, it, it, it existed in a, a kind of a vacuum, in an unusual situation because of oil production and uh, just the natural resources available in Venezuela, even though it was driven through the socialistic ideology, um, they succeeded. Hugo Chavez passed away and he appointed his successor uh, who is now fighting to take over control, and his successor is Nicolas Maduro, who is uh, the one that was appointed by Chavez. He went through one term as president. There was another election, and uh, that election has been really, uh, by the international community, has been discounted by the ruling uh, classes and, and uh, party in Venezuela, has been said to be, fraud be fraudulent, but he has the military on his side. And so even though it was a disputed election and the world's, uh, community has come against him. Uh, another man has st stood up. His name is uh, Juan Giado. Juan Giado, probably said that wrong, but Juan Giado. He's the self-appointed president, but, but really not only self-appointed. He's the president of the opposition party, but he doesn't have the military to support him. So um, even though the United States and other countries have said they support him, um, there's this, this issue because Maduro has the, the, uh, the military behind him. So a lot of things are happening there. Maduro is pushing the socialist agenda. Unfortunately, oil prices have gone almost in half of where they were when Chavez was president. Um, things have changed dramatically. This has led to enormous unrest. There are grocery stores that are empty. People do not have food. Families that are starving. There are riots in the streets, all because of the socialist agenda that's being pursued. And uh, now the international community will probably get involved, at least in some way. So uh, it's a crazy situation, but but the reason we're talking about it, beyond just being just this this uh, international situation that we may have to deal with, it, it highlights the failings of socialism. And uh, socialism is ideology uh, that instead of believing in the uh, opportunity for all of us to succeed or fail on our own, it's this, uh, this idea that we have an equality of outcomes instead of just the equality of opportunity. And uh, now we see many in our own government um, talking about socialism and 
uh, even many Americans who are pursuing this ideology of socialism, even though it's failed. And, and uh, that's the reason we wanted to talk about it today. And uh, Chad, I know you've got a lot of strong opinions on this as well. Um, but it's crazy to see something that is absolutely destroying a country in one place being lifted up as uh, the next um, thing we want to pursue in a country like America. Well, it depends who you ask, right? You know, President Maduro, uh, he says everything's fine there. Uh, he put out. A, in fact, he put he put out a he put, he published a video uh, addressing the American people yeah. and uh, how great everything was in Venezuela. It's the most prosperous uh, nation in the world, and it's never been stronger. And and uh, and everything we see on the news about the country falling apart and uh, people starving and having to eat animals and digging through trash and right. uh, is all a lie. And uh, and in fact, he even he even pointed to he just uh, he pleaded with the American people to that we need to see. That our president, that President Trump, is in in cahoots with the media to tell this lie to the world that uh, Venezuela is starving now. Uh, and, and President it, Trump uh, doesn't feel like he can get the media yeah. to uh, to get on <laughs> this side of anything. So. Well, well, that, that, there's the clue, right? That he, when right. He, uh, he can say a lot of things about the president and uh, and uh, and say what you know what the world believes is not true, but when he says President Trump is a uh, is aligned with the U.S. media. Right. He, I think I think we all know. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know he's not telling the right. truth. But uh, I mean, it's it, the country's upside down. It's falling apart. The people are starving, and uh, and and what's insane, and what I think the lesson that us as Americans need to realize is this happened in in a very short time period yeah. to where just what ten years ago Venezuela was a prospering nation. Yeah, and. It- the crazy thing about it is is socialism works when the economy is going crazy in a positive way, when there are unlimited natural resources, when everything's working the way it's supposed to. But when that stops because there's no diversity of opportunity and diversity of work and because no one is allowed to pursue their own uh, principles and, and goals and agenda because the government's controlling everything. When the government is weak, then the bottom falls out of the economy and everything else. So yeah, it happens very, very quickly. I mean, this is uh, you know, this is what we're seeing in, in the country right now, where you look at uh, you look at some some of these these new newly elected Congress members in the United States. Uh, you know, co- the Congress lady out of uh, out of North Dakota, uh, 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 Congress Congressman Congresswoman Omar, uh, who's asking for ninety percent uh, tax rates. And yeah, you got you, you have you have. Uh, you have Alexander Cortez, who's uh, you know, she's she's t- talking about numbers of seventy to eighty percent tax right, rates, and right, and uh, but but taxing the wealthy, right, the people who right, could yeah. afford it, right, the, yeah, the people that make right. ten ten million dollars or more, right. and uh, you know, uh, lots of countries have tried this. France is one of them, and uh, what the, what we discover is when you start taxing people uh, who make that much money uh, at rates of 70, 80, 90 percent, that's another thing that that people with money have the ability to do besides make a lot of money and be successful. They have the ability to move and move right. their money and move their resources. And, uh, and so it's just unsustainable. And then you end up, you know, in a short period of time, like Venezuela, uh, just, you know, suffering you, people are starving and, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, so I don't think the long-term plans are really, uh, looked at as they talk about in the United States, but it's something we should be talking about in the United States because this isn't just, uh, this isn't just talk anymore. This is, a uh, becoming a popular belief system uh, right. amongst amongst people in, in America. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting because we know that socialism doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. It's never worked. It's not going to work. The math doesn't add up. There's no way that you can look at socialistic policies, particularly economic policies, and come to the conclusion that it's going to work here, even though it's never worked at any other point in history. Um, so I think the question to ask, and, and one that needs to be answered, and this is where uh, providing a, a kind of a worldview around this is, is important, uh, the question to be asked is, is this, if we know it doesn't work, we can see it right now in real time failing, and, and not just in Venezuela, right, in, in a lot of other countries, um, we, we, we know that it doesn't work, we see that it's failing, um, and yet we still want to pursue the socialistic ideology and agenda. The question has to be asked, why? Why would we still want to do that? And I think it's interesting to look at the change in morality and uh, social beliefs and social norms over the course of you know, our limited history as the United States and to see that socialism and, and conversations around that have always been around. 
But now they've really gained a, a seat at the table, and there is a level of prominence with this, this ideology to the point that it really could be something that we pursue in an even greater way than we are now. So the real question, I think, is why are we pursuing something that we absolutely know doesn't work? Right. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, uh, Alexander Cortez, is, you know, she's kind of got slammed in the media for not being able to answer her own, questions to her own proposals. Right. Uh, you know, when he talks about, like, housing for all, Medicare for all, uh, and, and education for all. Uh, but then the same people that have a – and I believe a lot of this is uh, – I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that it's goodwill – that they really have a, a burdened heart to help right. people. And a lot of this is couched in that, right? It's, it's couched in yeah. that, that talk that we're trying to take care of people. Yeah. We're trying to take care of people. But the same people that like that push for that are also pushing for open borders. And so now you have, you know, free healthcare, free housing, right. free education, right. Right. And, and an open border environment. And it, it's clearly unsustainable. Even without the open borders, it's not sustainable. Even at a, a tax rate of 70 to 90%, it's not sustainable. I mean, we're talking... Uh, you know, we're talking at, uh, with the tax plan that, that she proposed being able to, uh, being able to cover just a small percentage of this, right. like 10% of it. And so the, the problem, the problem lies with, uh, this ideology. And I think, I think when we on this show, you're not, you and, Jer- uh, you and I, Jeremy, were talking about this. This seems like a political conversation. Sure. And, uh, I don't believe it is a political conversation. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't believe that, uh, politicians get to hijack uh, conversations like this that need right. to be had. Right. And we can't, we shouldn't uh, tiptoe around these conversations and say, hey, we can't talk about this stuff because it's, it's too political. This right. is important things that we have to address in our nation and, uh, and we should be able to talk about them in, a, in yeah, non-political it, forums. Uh, <clears throat> politics, you know, I, I like to say politics is not really a thing. Like it doesn't really exist. It, it's, a, it's a function, it's a title, it's a structure but it really is the outflow of society and culture, right? Um, our politics simply reflect what we as a nation believe. Our, our, our politicians, and although we say we don't, they don't represent us, they represent someone. They may not represent all of us, but they represent someone. Politics is just it's the reflection of that. So uh, although we can say things are political, really what it all comes down to is how do you view yourself, how do you view God, and how do you view the world? And, and this is no different than that. I, I think, and again, you and I have talked about this, that the reason people will pursue a, a socialist agenda or a, a socialistic ideology, that people are so entrenched in this, is because socialism at its root says that I am not responsible for my own actions. I can do whatever I want to do, and someone else needs to take care of me. And, and, and what is that? That, I mean, that's that's the root of all of the problems that we're looking at. We, you know, we talked about well, there's border security, the, the issues that are, uh, man, being had, talking about the, the abortion issues, uh, a big component of the abortion issue. Why in the world would we even have these conversations? Because we, as a people, don't want to be responsible for our actions. And, and that's, to me, that's, that's really where the heart of this issue, particularly this discussion around socialism, lies. Take it away from people that have worked hard to get it. Give it to people that haven't worked hard to have it because we're not responsible for what we do. We're all the same. And that's a that's a real problem. But we can't confuse this with being goodwilled because, right. I mean, the, Bi- the Bible clearly calls us to be uh, people of goodwill, yes. people who, who will help our neighbor. Uh, right. for 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Right. And so the, the the Bible calls us to to help the people that can't help themselves, yep. to 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 feed the homeless, to take care of our neighbor. But that is a that is a as the Bible tells us this, that is a mandate on us as individuals. Right. Uh, not on the government to dictate how we do that. Yep. And uh, and I think that's where the the problem the problem really lies is uh, the difference between individual goodwill. Yes. And charitable and being charitable and doing the right thing as the Bible calls us to and having a government mandate on that. And when you step into that, that's that government control, the heart comes out of it. And, uh, you know, and I think it's against the, the word of God of how we should live. And that's where we see these problems un- unfold. Yeah. And, and the, the, the purpose of goodwill, the purpose of charity. And again, the Bible is very clear on that. Jesus talked about that, uh, you know, ministering to the least of these and, and feeding and clothing and taking care of, of those who can't take care of themselves. We're told to take care of 
uh, widows and orphans in their affliction, that there's no really greater calling than doing that. The Bible's very clear on that. But like you said, it's also very clear that those who don't take care of their own household and the household of faith are worse than the unbeliever. The purpose of goodwill, the purpose of, of charity, if you will, the purpose of taking care of those who can't take care of themselves, isn't to trap them in a system that incentivizes them to stay there. It's to, you know, we, we maybe in a trite way use the, the statement, we need to not give a hand out, but give a hand up. Really, that's the goal of charity, and that's the goal of goodwill, and we should do that. But it's helping others to get to a place where they can take care of themselves. That's the opposite of a political ideology that says, let's trap you in a system where you can't do anything outside of us. I mean, it, Mighty Oaks uh, is, as an organization, I think it's just a great illustration of this. Uh, we, we've said this so many times, our organization, Mighty Oaks, and the programs we run are not to help these poor veterans right. who can't help themselves. Right, right. These, these poor guys, they've been to combat, and so they're entitled to be taken care of, and, and we should just love on them. And no, that's not how, how right. we've been successful. We go and we 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 reach reach down to where, where they may be struggling in a dark pit they may be in and pull yeah. them out. We pull them out not for the purpose of just getting well, but to be in a position to help the next person to join in a fight and be contributors uh, right. to their communities again. And uh, that's opposite. That's completely opposite of, of, a, of a socialistic system. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where we're building, we're building victims to, to depend on us as an organization. We don't want these guys to depend on us. Uh, we got we got enough people to help. Right. <laughs> we, we, I mean, right. we want them to move on. We want them to move on and even replicate what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's you know, uh, creating professional victims has been a something that's increasingly has grown in yes. our country, and it's no surprise uh, that this you know, kind of socialism movement is the next step. Absolutely, yeah. And personal responsibility is the answer to all of this, right? Um, and you, again, you look at a situation like that being had in Venezuela, um, the, the population there has been so trapped in this system that has made them dependent on the government that when the government no longer functions the way that it's supposed to, they don't have any other options. They, they can't be responsible for themselves because incentives and opportunity have been taken away from them. And, and really, from a political standpoint, we should... Um, champion the ideology that says every American has a right to pursue their own path and pursue their own direction and accomplish and succeed and be rewarded for succeeding uh, apart from the government. And in life, it should be the same. Yeah, I mean, socialism punishes virtue. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right, that's right. I mean, if, if you're going to be, if you're going to get out and work hard and yep. uh, the, incent the incentive is immediately removed, uh, removed from from the individual right and uh what what incentive is there for me to work my butt off build an organization yeah. that may that may employ thousands of people right when i'm having to give up 90 percent of what man this maybe i'll just jump on the other side and have someone take care of me sure you know yeah and it impacts every area of life and and what we need to fight against uh you know what we do like you mentioned or as you mentioned as an organization and what we need to fight against personally in our homes or even for us as individuals is this idea that someone else is responsible for me. We need to utilize our gifts, our opportunities, our resources to take care of those that we're responsible for, but then to take care of those who can't take care of themselves and help them get to a place where they can take care of themselves. Uh, we were created by God with unique opportunities, unique gifts, and we should have the opportunity and the freedom in our country or in our homes or in our communities to be able to exercise those. And the idea of socialism, taking away from those that have and giving to those that don't have, um, it really says that's that's not a virtue we're interested in. You know, there's, there's lots of angles we could go on this, but I, I don't believe that we should, uh, I, I just as a culture, continue to have these conversations, be allowed uh, by people in the, that have these socialistic views to pigeonhole us right. and say as a nation that we can't love people, we can't care for people right. unless, unless we're just giving people handouts. And, uh, and that's just not true. We, uh, you know, we, there's plenty of ways and we always have as a, as a nation, we've always have been able to care for people and love on people without being a socialist government. Uh, and through capitalism, we, we, we've uh, amassed an incredible amount of wealth and in, in the United States of America, we've been, you know, we are the greatest nation in the world right. and we are, a we are a charitable nation. Yep. Uh, we, we take care of, of, uh, we take, we take care of the homeless and hungry around the world. Uh, and, um, 
you know, on issues like the border, uh, while people, you know, say a mortal wall is immoral. Man, America is the number one uh, country in the world that allows people to come into, into our nation. We, we are the number one migration uh, migration country in the world. And we have been for a very long time. Right. And I believe, I believe we will continue to be uh, under this president and under other presidents. Why? Because the American people uh, is a people of immigrants and people who continue to open our borders and welcome people into, into this, this nation. And people will continue to come because it is the greatest nation. And, uh, but we don't need to be a, a, a socialist government to do that. In fact, uh, for us to be able to do that well, and for us to be able to do that sustained for a long period of time, we need to uh, stick to our, our, our cap capitalist roots and uh, continue to amass wealth, uh, have the motivation to build, uh, be entrepreneurial and build organizations and create jobs and, and strengthen our economy. And that's the best way forward to be able to truly serve, serve our neighbors. Yeah, and you know all of these issues are connected. And what's the connection is that we as a nation need to afford individuals the opportunity to exercise uh, their own opportunities and gifts, et cetera, as you mentioned. And, and if we'll do that, we've demonstrated that we will indeed be charitable and, and help those who, who need to be helped. Um, but this ideology is what we need to fight against. And uh, like so many of these things, I, I, I don't think, again, it is a political conversation. We need to vote and, and deal with it on that political level. But, but really what we need to do is teach our kids to be responsible, teach our kids to work hard, teach those that we have the opportunity to influence to not depend on others. And yet as they're um, developing their own lives and amassing whatever level of wealth to themselves to be generous and to be kind toward others. And if we'll do that on this end, then the other end will take care of itself. But we've got to be afforded the opportunity to do that. And my vote is, I don't think we're going to... Uh... To war with Venezuela, uh, you know, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think President Maduro is uh, right when he said that we're about to America is about to engage in another Vietnam with Venezuela. You know, I don't think that's going to happen, and um, you know, I could be wrong on this, but uh, you know, I, I think the the world is uh, knows the truth about what's going on there, and uh, America is not alone in, in standing against what's going on in uh, in Venezuela right now. Right. Yeah, so I guess we'll see in the days ahead. Um, our president, as always, is keeping all of the options open. So uh, I guess we'll see. But um, for our part, I think focusing on personal responsibility and uh, just doing what, doing what we've always done and doing what we've always been able to do is, uh, is the right path forward. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate it. We'll talk again uh, next week on something, um, I don't know, maybe not quite as big. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows what happens in the next seven days? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, a lot of happen. A lot happens every day. Oh. You can either watch, you know, get on some news feeds, or uh, or the president's Twitter. Right. And stay stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Just stay, stay tuned. All right. And with that, for those who are watching, uh, thank you for watching. Stay tuned, and we will uh, see you in just a couple minutes with our special guest, Gene Cook. Our guest today is a, a good friend and. Someone that I've gotten to know pretty well over the last couple of years. He's worked with My Yokes in various capacities as well. So we've, uh, we've known each other in a lot of different ways. But Gene Cook, Gene currently is the uh, proprietor, the owner of uh, Car Carlson Gracie Wine Country. Carlson Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Wine Country. And uh, he owns that and has for a little over a year now, I guess. Almost two years. Almost two years. Man, it's crazy. April will be two years. It's crazy how fast that is. Uh, but Gene, uh, that he's doing that now. But uh, his his history and his life is uh, pretty eclectic. You, you've done quite a bit, quite a bit, uh, a lot of different things. And uh, because of that, I think brings a unique perspective. And this is what I want to talk to Gene about today. It brings a unique perspective to uh, faith throughout your life and what it is to be a Christian. I think sometimes we look at faith and faith issues and and Christianity as something that is maybe reserved for professionals or for some portion of our lives. We're, we're Christians here, but maybe not there. Mm. And, and your, your story is really interesting to me for, for a lot of reasons. It's, it's an incredible story. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to me because you didn't grow up a person of faith, uh, at least not formally, not a Christian. Mm. You, you worked, you married young, you had kids young, you, you lived your life, you came into a relationship with Christ, you pastored for a while. 
uh, in both capacity as an assistant pastor, you pastored a church, started a church, uh, you owned a business and have owned a business. You then uh, got really involved in jujitsu and started a school. And, and through all of that, all of those, those stages, I guess really after coming to Christ, um, Christianity has just been um, part of who you are. And it's, it's been a part of what you've done in, in all of those places. And I think one of the me- messages that we need to communicate, one of the important messages for us to understand is that Christianity, um, faith, it's not something that's reserved for a particular time of our life or place in our life or job or season. If you're a Christian, a person of faith, that is who you are, and that should, should really be a thread throughout. Um, so I appreciate you talking to us a little bit today. And uh, you can follow Gene if you'd like more information about Gene on his Instagram account. It's the best place to find you. Yes. It's BJJ Moses. Yes. Yes. You're, uh, you're kind of jiu-jitsu name. That's my jiu-jitsu name. BJJ Moses, because you look like Moses. That's what they Not say. because you're old, because you look like That's Moses. That's right. That's right. what I like to think. Right. <laughs> so BJJ Moses on Instagram. Uh, you can find him there. Um, but tell us your story. Start from you know your childhood. Talk a little bit about that. You grew up in California. And really to the point of faith, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so I was raised, like you said, born in, born and raised in San Diego, which yeah. is kind of rare for yeah. people my age. Not too many people are born in San Diego. Um, <clears throat> never went to church uh, except for when I was five years old. So when I was five years old, my mother uh, decided that she was going to take me to church, sure. and um, I was kind of excited. And I'll never, I can remember this as just like it happened yesterday. Um, she took me into a place where they had the kids, you know, and... Uh, I watched her leave. Uh, she, she, instead of going into the sanctuary, she got in her car and she left. She dropped you off. And I was upset about that. Yeah. And so I, when she got back, uh, I let her know, like, hey, where did you go? Like, I thought we were going to church. Yeah. And then uh, we, she never took me again after that. Um, and I'll, she said, what did you guys do? I said, we would just watch like a Walt Disney cartoon. Right. Um, it was United Methodist Church. Okay. Uh, in Imperial Beach. But we um, that was probably never the, went to church. That was like the child care area yes, probably yeah, for yeah. the parents who were going to the service yes. or whatever. Yeah. 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 The other parents. Yeah. The other parents who were going to the service. Yeah. But you know, I mean, looking back now, she had good intentions. Sure. So, uh, never went to church again. And when I was in the seventh grade, I got into some trouble at school. I was having a problem being bullied a little bit. And, uh, part of it might've been my fault also. I have a smart mouth. <laughs> and so she decided to put me in a Lutheran school. Mm-hmm. So she sent me to a Lutheran school and I stayed there for six months or half of half of a school year. And it was that time that I really, for the first time, like we had chapel service and it, it was the ever, first time I've ever prayed. Mm. And so I often forget about that when I tell people about my upbringing, but I just happen to remember it. And so, but then I went to a public school the next year right. and never really thought about God or anything right. like that again, uh, up until the time my first child was born. So when I was 21 years old, I married my, my high school sweetheart. We had a, a son at age, I was 21 and, um, I started thinking about the deeper things of life. Right. In, in conjunction with that, I was working with a pastor, uh, at a, not at a church, but at a at the San Diego Union Tribune, mm. and he was there working next to me, and we had become friends. And he had um, been asking me questions, you know. So, what are you going to tell this boy when right. he asks you, uh, where did he come from, or right. this God right. exists? Right. What are you going to tell him? Right. And so I started arguing with him, and he's the first person that ever really challenged me. Mm. I could usually, I, I always thought I was a smart guy, right? So yep. I could kind of shut down Christians yep. pretty easy. Right. Uh, but this guy, he, I couldn't shut him down. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wow, everything, every objection that I raise with him, yeah. he has an answer to that I haven't heard. Mm. And it kind of makes sense. Yeah. And so he really got me thinking. I attended his, his church for a short period of time um, before I began to have marriage problems. And then my marriage just fell apart. Um, I met my current wife, Grace, um, within just a couple months of that breakup. Yeah. And so we've been together since 1987, yeah, wow. uh, which is a, a pretty good chunk of time. It's a long time. Yeah. Grace looks so young. You look old, but Grace looks really young. <laughs> she does. Yeah. You must have married her when she was a child. Well, she's Filipino. So yeah, well, there's Filipinos there's, yeah. traditionally age more gracefully sure. than <laughs> white males, right? Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah, she's the same age as me, yeah. uh, one year apart, and everybody thinks you know that she's like fifteen years younger than right. me, right. which I have no problem with. Right. I'm cool with that. Sure. sure. Um, so we got married and had uh, uh, another kid. So now this is going to be my third because I had two the first 
yeah. first. Yeah. So we got married, had another baby, um, and uh, she had uh, she had confronted me because I I wasn't. Um, let, let me back up a little bit. Sure. We, we didn't get married. We lived together. Mm. And we uh, were having problems because I was still kind of, you know, talking to other women yeah. and, you know, yeah. meeting women and, and engaging in conversation and sure. obtaining their phone. Back, that was back when you would get a girl's phone number. <laughs> so she found a phone yeah. number in my pocket at the right. gas station. Uh, it would actually was in the middle console, not my pocket, but the middle console of the car while yeah. I was out pumping gas. And I looked in there and I saw it and I said, oh, this is going to be a problem. So she um, confronted me on it and said, you know, we're done. Like, you know, we're, we're just yeah. done. And I don't want to have any part of this. And uh, I want to just raise my daughter and uh, go on with life without you. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is just a week before that, we had bought a Christmas tree at a church parking lot. Um, and the pastor started talking to me, inviting me to church, went out to the car, tied it on my car. It was the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. And so... That uh, that night, I told Grace, I said, I realize what the problem is. I know what the problem is. The problem is I need to commit my life to God. Wow. And she thought that I was just um, fabricating some creative idea to keep her with me. Sure, sure. You're going to try yeah. to manipulate her yeah. into staying there. Yeah. yeah, right. I was basically, you know, <laughs> pulling, pulling out sure. my ace in the hole, which is, right. we got to go to church. Right, <laughs> right, right. Jesus so, will fix this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But because up until then, she never heard me talk about God or about yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And so um, she says, okay, well, you do what you have to do. Right. And let's see how it works. And, right. and I'm going to continue to go my own way. And so the next day, that was a Saturday night. The next morning, I got, I woke up early and went to church. I went to that pastor's church. Yeah. And, uh, that was really, um, I think, when I was 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 saved. You know, when I the blinders came off, and yeah. I realized for the first time, like, you know, I've been living my life for myself. Yeah. And um, there is a God out there. And there's right. a, a Savior who died for me. Right. All those truths, I think, uh, flooded my mind yeah. at that time. Yeah. And uh, from that day forward, I decided that I wanted to have a relationship with Christ. I wanted to follow Him and and be a disciple. So, um, I'm one of those guys, as you know, um, I think Chad is the same way and maybe you are to some degree, although you seem a little bit more, uh, throttled in, in, from just I'm knowing. very disciplined, Gene. Yeah. Very discipline. Disciplined. What, I'm not talking about discipline. I'm talking about going, throwing yourself 110% oh, right, right, right. at whatever right. you get interested sure. in. Yeah, sure. So all of my life, whatever I would be interested in, I would just. 110. 110%. Yeah. yeah. There was like. And you can ask my mom about this when I was right, a kid. And right. So I, all of a sudden, you know, my goal now is to read the whole Bible, like in the shortest amount of time I sure. can. So as soon as I get off work, I sit down, at, I'm with Grace, I'm just reading the Bible, reading the Bible, mm-hmm. highlighting it, marking yep. it up, and going to church on Wednesday night for Bible study, going to church on Sunday morning for the regular service, going back on Sunday night for the evening service. Right. I just couldn't get enough. Right. Watching it on TV every chance I right. got. Although yeah. there's a lot of wackos on sure. TV. So I was just, I was all in. So what was Grace doing during that all the time? Because um, here's something you and I talked about, and we've seen certainly, yeah. is a spouse will say, I'm going to give my life to Christ. Yeah. That's the answer. That's the answer. And they're 110% in, and they just haven't taken their spouse along with them. Was that was that you and Grace? I tried to take her along, but yeah. it wasn't God's timing yet. Sure. It wasn't God's timing at all. In fact, um, at first, she thought it was great. Look, um, Gene doesn't drink alcohol anymore. He doesn't listen to, you know. He's not getting girls' phone numbers. No. <laughs> he's like, he's on the straight and narrow, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so she's telling her girlfriends, they're like, oh, that's great. You know, yeah. good job. Right, right. Uh, like six months later, she said, I feel like I'm married to a Catholic priest. Because she had grown up Roman Catholic. Her exposure to the church yeah. was Catholicism. Right. Very so rigid. Very, she's like, I, yeah. and, and I was... Uh, this happens to a lot of men in the beginning. They're overly legalistic because you don't know. You don't. I told her, look, you cannot, you cannot listen to rock music anymore. You cannot wear that dress. You cannot wear those shoes. I don't want you wearing that color lipstick anymore. Right. Um, right. Soap right. operas. She watched soap operas on a regular basis. Yeah. No more soap operas. Yeah. And it was just too much, you know. But I was. I didn't know. I was like, you know, I just wanted to. I wanted the best for her. You were sincere. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I was over the top. Yeah, sure. Instead of, uh, I think looking back, a better approach would have been to uh, maybe seek some pastoral guidance on how to handle the situation. Yeah. Um, pray for her a little bit more. Sure. Sure. Uh, ask God for patience. Yeah. And, uh, and so, as you can imagine, within a very short amount of time, our marriage was on the rocks. And it got to the point where I was like, I, I was convinced that, that God wanted me to go into full-time ministry. And so I was going to Bible college. I, I, <laughs> I would go to, I took a job from 4 p.m. to 1 a.m., all right, yep. so that I could go to Bible college during the day. <laughs> all right, that's how, that's how yep. crazy I was. And so that I could watch my daughter. I took her with me and I checked her into a Christian preschool. Okay. Yep. So I was, we didn't have to put her in daycare because I was watching her in the day. And then at 3.30, I would hand her to where said, just as she was getting yep. off. I wouldn't come home until 1 o'clock. You can imagine what that does to a marriage. Now you have a Christian and a non-Christian living in the same house. And you're not spending time together. You're not spending any time yep. together. And she gets to the point where she just despises you. Yep. Because you remind her of everything that she doesn't want to be reminded yep. of. Yep. So it went bad pretty quick. And so she came to me and said, look, uh, I don't want to be married to you anymore. Yeah. And I was like shocked, like, huh, you don't want to be married to me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, you're the one with the problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I told her, I said, look, you know, I'm going into full-time ministry, and that's going to require a Christian wife. So this is just like how crass I was at the time because I was upset. And I said, yeah. So maybe this is God's way of getting rid of you and getting me a Christian wife. Because at, at the Bible yeah. college, there's all kinds of yeah. Christian women over That's there. the best way, really, to win yeah. your wife over, I think, yeah. is by having conversations like that. But you know what's interesting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it kind of worked. Yeah. I, well, it didn't work right away. I planted the seed. And it was probably God who worked. Yes. Yeah, it, not was, that conversation it definitely maybe. was God yeah. who worked. So what happened was um, we separated. Mm. And um, and then it, I, I basically told her, look, I, I want to move on with my life, so let's just file for divorce. And then she was like, well, have you met anybody? And I kind of bluffed her. I was like, well, I've met some, yeah, I've met some people I'm interested in. Why? And, and uh, <clears throat> She said, well, we need to talk. And then this, about a month had gone by, and we were living apart. And so we talked, and she said, I've, I've uh, kind of, re- I'm, not that ha- I'm not happy. I've reconsidered, and uh, I'm, I'm ready to try going to church with you. Wow. Yeah, which wow. I was like, yeah. wow, this is like a big turn of events that I hadn't. Uh, yeah. But what's interesting is we had a bunch of people at church praying for her at this mm-hmm. time. And some of her friends that I had come in contact with that were Christians from yeah. high school. We're praying for her. Yeah. And so she, uh, I said, okay, f- now I'm not sure if you're bluffing me. Yeah. So why don't you, you, you want to go to church? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you go to church? Because I was kind of bitter at this point. I was, I mean, you would think I would be like overjoyed, right? I'm getting my wife back. Families reunited. We have two kids by this time. I took the younger one cause he was a really hard uh, baby to deal with. And I said, I'm not walking out of this marriage without a child. And so like I did the first time. Yeah. And so I took him with me and um, she missed him. And I said, so you go to church on Sunday. I'll go to my church. You go to your church and, and you let me know how it goes. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause I thought, okay, well, let's see how this goes. So yeah. she got all excited and she came back and she told me what the sermon was about. And, and uh, she continued to tell me, Hey, I want to get back together. And so um, I said, well, let's, let's, ease back in. I'm not going to pick up all my stuff and move back in if we're going to go through this again. Yeah. And so within a couple months, we were back together. Um, and we, uh, we, we were doing fine. Yeah. And so what's interesting is th- this is now 1994. So in around September, October, 1994, we reconciled. And, um, in, by July of 1996, I was starting a church. Wow which is wow. a little bit too quick, I think. Someone might advise against that. Somebody did advise me yeah. against, that, <laughs> right. against that. And um, I um, I didn't receive it. I, I told them, you know, get behind me. And, that, and that's part of that. <laughs> that's part of that diving into whatever. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah, right. kind of me throwing myself out sure, of it. Sure, but sure. when he told me that I wasn't ready and that my wife wasn't ready, yeah. it just made me want to succeed that much more. Sure. Which, you know, going into um, a church plant with... The idea of this is going to succeed no matter what. I'm going to prove them wrong. Yes, yeah. it, you're already kind of. Sure. But yeah. nevertheless, God was pleased to bless that. Mm-hmm. And so in, we, uh, 
it, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if we have time for me to go into really what triggered that yeah. that uh, church yeah. plant, but I had a I had a I was running a business at the time. I was I owned a screen printing business, and I was working out of this eleven hundred square foot warehouse, and I got an opportunity to go work with another screen printer at his place, and we were going to kind of share, and so I took that opportunity. And there was one of my clients who had a college ministry and he said, I would like to turn this into like a, a meeting place for college people. Uh, put some couches in here and we can have Bible studies. In and, the screen frame. Please. Yes, I'll rent it from you. Yeah. And so I said, okay. So he rented it um, and completely tore out all the walls. Hmm. But he didn't pay me rent yet. So he said he was going to pay me on the first, right? I gave yeah. him like a month to get it ready. Right. So I went down there on the first to, to hit him up and to get some money so I could pay the rent because I'm still renting it. Yeah. And um, he's not there, but there's a pulpit inside. And the place is completely stripped out. There's a pulpit there. And so I was like, I called him up and said, hey, man, we need to meet so I can get the money. He goes, oh, man, one of our donors dropped out. And so we're not going to be able to move yeah. forward with it. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, so I remember I was leaning on that pulpit. And I was praying like, Lord, like this is the last thing that I needed right now. Mm. And during that time when he was getting it ready, I, I had a little bit of jealousy. Like, why didn't I think of this? Like, he's, he's going to start a ministry in here. And then like the light came on. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go what, what else do you want me to do? You right. want me to put some chairs up for you? <laughs> right. There's a pulpit. Right. The walls are gone. Right. You got a room over there for the little kids. And uh, so I had to make rent. So I said, we were starting a church in three weeks. <laughs> Because we need to take an offering. I didn't have anybody <laughs> there. I figured I'd get some people supporting me. All right. I figured I'd talk to my parents. They'd yeah. support me. Yeah, yeah. Wrong. They did support <laughs> me, but they weren't writing a check. Sure. They're like, Gene. We support you. We'll come to your service. Right. 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 We'll be there. But look, we don't want to, if this is a, if this is really a God, yeah. like you say it is, yeah. then don't worry. You'll be fine. Yeah. And that was the smartest. I, I was kind of like, why are my parents like, yeah. You know, don't they see what I'm trying to Sure. That was the smartest thing they could have done, looking back. That was wisdom. So I started the church three weeks later, uh, July 21st, 1996. Invited everybody I knew. There was like uh, about 58 people that, that came with women, men, women, and children. Yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Week two, <laughs> 10 people showed up. <laughs> Right? That's because everybody else goes to different churches already, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you're our friend, Gene, but look, we're already plugged in. We have in a church, and, right? Yeah, we got a church. Like, thanks for right. inviting us, but, and we'll come and visit you from time to time, but, you know. So, um, I just, I just continue, like, I really believe that that was God's plan, and so I continued just to be faithful, and uh, within, like, one year, it developed into a full-time ministry. I was able to quit my job. We got another building, um, and, and I pastored that church for... Until 2007, yeah, December of 2007, mm. so 11 years, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. so that was a great experience. Yeah. After, after, why did I quit? 2007, we had moved to Temecula in 2004, so for three years I was commuting because I didn't want my wife to work, right. so we bought a house in Temecula, she quit her job, yeah. and now I was just commuting back and forth, and it was fine, but in... We got, I got kind of sick of that after three years. So I said, let's start a church in Temecula. So we tried to start a church in Temecula. Yep. After a couple of years, it just kind of fizzled out. Yeah. And so uh, I decided, well, this church plan obviously wasn't of God. So we kind of disseminated into lo other local churches yep. in Temecula. And then uh, I started a business. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've been kind of the business guy since then. Yeah. Different businesses, but, uh, but business. Um, so a couple of things with your story and... I'd love to get your perspective on on two things, I guess, primarily. Maybe three things, because it's interesting to think about how God led you from one place to the next. And I, I think it's really important. I, I, I say this often, and it's very important to understand that our responsibility is to do what God says in front of us. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I think, particularly Christian people, um, and, and there may be people who would watch the show that aren't Christian people. They just maybe like some of the other things we talk about. Um but for those people, I would say Christian people don't have it all figured out, right? We don't have it all figured out. No. Um, and for the Christians who are watching that aren't doing anything because they can't see the end from the beginning, my encouragement would be you don't have to see the end. You just need to see the next step. If God drops a pulpit in an empty room, 
Yeah. Maybe that's him telling you to take the next step. Yeah. And then when you take the one after that, if you know it goes as long as God wants it to, and then maybe it's time to transition to something else. Mm-hmm. But really, that's the Christian life. It's it's moving from one thing to the next as God leads. Sometimes that means someone's in a, a business for sixty years and they're Christian businessmen. Sometimes it means they pastor a church for forty or fifty years, or they're on the mission field, or whatever. The thing is not as important as the pursuit of God. Yeah. And I think that's I been agree with kind that. of your testimony is, yeah. what does God want me to do now? Yeah. So over the course of your life, uh, being a Christian, being a Christian, not doing Christian things, but being a Christian is, is, uh, is the theme, but you didn't start there. No. How did you come from the place where you said, it's, you use the word legalism, that means different things to different people, but it's, it's this, you have to look right and sound right and be right, and, and it's, it's this, to, I want to be a Christian wherever yeah. I am. How did you make that transition, and, and how did you find maybe some equilibrium in that? Yeah, if, I really, if, I, if I'm really honest in my answer, I, I think that uh, I found the balance in that when I really came to grips with my own inability uh, to live righteously. My own, when I, when I real, when you, when you really read the law Hmm. and and I'm not just talking about the old Testament law, I'm talking about, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, right? When you read, it really highlights your imperfections. Yeah. And so the last thing I think any of us want to be is a hypocrite, Hmm. but I think we're all hypocrites at some level. Why, Why do you say that? Because we are often blind to our own, uh, imperfections, Mm -hmm. right? So for example, it drives me crazy that my wife is late all the time. Have I ever been late? (laughs) Yeah. And this is what, this is an exercise that I do when I get upset with somebody for doing something. I ask myself, have I ever done that? Have I ever done it once? If I've done it once, you know, then the fact that we're judgmental about other people. Yes. While excusing our own imperfections, yes. that's hypocrisy. Yes. Yeah. And so I think I think as I got a little bit older um, and more mature in my faith and my understanding, and I realized um, that my acceptance with God, and this was, this was a big one that I realized kind of early on, but it, it still continues to resonate, yeah. and it should for all of us as Christians. My acceptance to God wasn't based on um, my style of like, my style of dress yeah. was I wearing a, a suit with a tie. Right. It, it wasn't even based on my what I say yeah. or what I do. Yeah. It was based solely on Christ. And so I came to the realization that, look, um, this whole idea about categorizing people into two categories, good people and bad people, that's, that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach because even good people need to repent sometimes of their goodness. Right. If they if they if they feel that they don't need God because they have their life together, right. certainly they're lost. Yeah, that goodness becomes bad. Yes. Right. That, that pride. Their, right? Yeah, their self righteousness. Yeah. Yep. Or their their false sense of righteousness. Yeah. When you compare it to the the standard of Christ, um, is the is the thing that's most detrimental to them. Yeah. And so I I try to be real. I try to, I try to honestly assess my own. I really got to the place in my life where I started thinking, you know, Gene, the big problem here is not those guys. The big problem is right here in your chest. It's your heart. Yeah. You know, that's the number one thing that you need to be worried about, Gene, is your own heart because your heart is deceptive. Your heart uh, is an idol factory. Your heart is forever wandering away from Christ. And so when I began to kind of change my perspective and to an inward uh, retrospect rather than seeing the problem everywhere on the outside. Right. Oh, those people right. need the Ten Commandments over there, you know? Yeah. Uh, then things, my thinking started to change. Yep. And so I think I really backed off on the legalism and really backed off on... And it just as, you be, as you're a Christian and you meet other Christians and, you know, you get in a car with a Christian guy, he's been a Christian for 15 minutes and, you know, he turns on a rock station, you're like, yeah. oh, you listen to this music? And, yeah. and he challenges, he's like, well, yeah, uh, I do. Uh, you know, there's really... A lot of Christian music yeah. even has unbiblical sure. lyrics. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so there's not. So I, I think the main thing is that I I realize look that um, we're all sinners. Yeah. And that your sanctification is you, you've got a long way to go. And when you say when you say legalism for those that may not understand that term, yeah. that's that's really establishing yourself as the standard of yes. righteousness. Yeah. I mean that's a it's kind of a church word, right. but but what you're really saying is. 
I'm propping myself up as the standard, and I judge everyone else based on, on me. Right, the way I think things should be. Yeah. And because I don't do this, you shouldn't either. Right. And if you do this, yeah, I don't know. I remember walking this very early experience that, that I still remember this day. Um, I was working at Home Depot. And uh, I would always tell people that I'm a Christian. I carried a Bible in my pocket. They would, they would page me over the intercom. Reverend Gene, come to aisle five, right? <laughs> this is long before I was ever in ministry. Right. I was just a brand new Christian, but I was so vocal. Right. And to some degree, obnoxious. Um, <laughs> so this girl, this co-employee told me that she was a Christian. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Great. I like to know who the Christians are here, right? Right. And uh, I walked outside and she was smoking a cigarette outside. And I was disgusted. I was like, oh. How could you call yourself yeah. a Christian? Yeah. Um, she's not a Christian. Right. Yeah. And I don't know what her struggle was. I sure. don't know how if yep. she's trying to Chris. I First of all, that cigarette, that is not going to land you in hell, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what, what did I say? Uh, it won't send you to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've yeah, been exactly. there or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, but as you mature, I think you begin to realize that really... Um, and also legalism is, another definition is um, man-made law. Making laws where God hasn't. Right. Just trying to work right. your way into righteousness. Yes. And, and by, because by, by, God's standard is hard to keep. It's, it's impossible, Gene's standard, one would say. Yes. It's a little bit easier. Right. right. Even Gene can live up to that. Right. <laughs> right. So we got to get away from that. Yeah. Right. we got to got to realize that, um, and, and this is why I think it says in James, be be slow to speak and be quick. Uh, be, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Right. Um, and you've heard people say, like, the more I know, the more I realize how much I don't know. Yeah. So there's a humbling effect that takes place, I think, in time, as God through sanctification begins to kind of show you who you really are. Who you really are. Yes. And the there's man, there's so many applications of what you just said. I think again, uh, for those that are are listening and watching. Two applications in particular. One is this this area that we talk about often, identity. Yeah. Um, as humans, we want our heart is proud. We want to find our identity in things. We want to find meaning and value in things. But the problem with that is those things, whatever they are, will fail us. Mm -hmm. Those people that we find our identity in will fail us. It could be a spouse, a, a boss, a, a political leader. Yeah. They'll fail us. And the Bible helps us to understand that our identity should be found in Christ. It's it's not this 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 I have a deceitful heart or a dark heart or whatever. This isn't this isn't taking on this on a dirt bag no. kind of thinking. It's no. it's understanding yeah, I'm, I'm nothing in myself, yes. but I'm everything in yes. God. Yes. And that's my whole identity is there. Yes. So why would I right, why would I want to conceal that I belong right. to him? Right. And so I was um, yeah, that's good. A lot of what I say is good, Gene. Yeah. A lot of it. <laughs> and, and that's part of the reason why Jeremy brought me in here. Is yes. Because, uh, so I could teach I you. I compliment him so well. Yeah, right. By the way, if, you, if you're if <laughs> looking for some reading material. We have no. some books here. Yes. <laughs> um, let's fast forward a little bit. Sure. Because now uh, we we started this jiu-jitsu school. Yeah. Right? And about a year into the jiu-jitsu school, yep. I, I had made a comment to Chad. And I don't know, maybe it was, it might have been you. It sounds more like something you would say than what Chad said. So he probably heard you say it first and just repeated it. Um. <laughs> Be quick to listen, to slow to speak. Okay, said, go ahead. I said, you know, he says, uh, so you're going to go in, he goes, Gene, you're going to go, you're going to start a, uh, a jujitsu school. I said, yeah, he goes. And that's more of a, we're kind of talking about, that's more of a priority for you than getting back into like formal ministry. I said, well, yeah, I'm going to kind of, like, I want to reach people uh, for Jesus at the jiu-jitsu school. Mm -hmm. And then he said, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people start things like that, but it never uh, really That's interesting, so. yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was him, yeah. So, that he said that. And then I'm reading, like, about a year after we started the school, I'm reading the parable of the talents. And when I was a pastor, I used, I used to harp on the talents, you know, like, hey, man, look at which one of these are you? The parable of the talents is right. God puts something in your hands or the master puts something in your hands. Right. You can either bury it and not use it yeah. or invest it use and use it. And multiply it. Right. Multiply right. right. And at the end of the parable, the, the servant who invested, even at, at the risk of losing everything, is the one that's rewarded. Yep. And the guy that wanted to keep it safe and just keep a low profile, 
He gets nothing. Yep. In fact, it's taken from him and given the other. Sure. Guy. So I was reading that, and all of a sudden, I got super convicted. Mm. I felt guilty. I was like, wait a second. This is me right now. Because in Romans, it says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Yep, without repentance, that's right. So I was like, if I really believed that God has given me the gift of opening my mouth for him, how come I stop doing it? How come I'm not doing that anymore? Right. You know, at least, I mean, obviously I, I, you know, talk with my grandkids and, and, uh, but on a larger scale, hmm. you know, so that's when I decided, look, we need, I need, I need to exercise my gifts. Hmm. And so I went to my pastor and I said, look, I want to do this. I want to start this event, but it's going to be on a Sunday morning. Yeah. So I thought, well, maybe he'll shoot it down and I, I won't have to feel guilty anymore. <laughs> because every other morning of the week, like we have classes going on yep. or people aren't available. Like Saturday morning at shot, we have, I don't want to do it on a Saturday night or we got church on Saturday morning, Sunday morning. So I, I went to him and I talked to him. I said, look, I want to start this event called um, the last, or the last, the first Sunday yep. on the mat. Yep. And we'll, on the first Sunday of the month, we will have a, a Bible study. I'll invite everybody, yep. believer, unbeliever, I don't care, jujitsu student. Uh, and then we'll have a Bible study and then we'll put on our geese and, and we'll try to choke each other. Right. And, uh, he said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Go for it. So we just finished our fourth one yesterday. Yeah. And, uh, so far I think it's been successful. I mean, yeah. people I've got it based on the feedback I've gotten, I've gotten feedback, but here's something interesting that I was just thinking about last week. You and I were both pastors, right? Mm -hmm. And in that pastoral capacity, we hang out with people and we talk to people, we counsel people, we give them advice. Yep. I'm still doing that. Sure. But sure. I don't hold the title of pastor. Sure. Now I'm coach Gene. Mm. And I'll tell you what, it's almost, I mean, obviously when you're a pastor, your main context is dealing with Christians, right? Who are members of your church. But um, they Christians should have pastors and, and counselors to go to. Yes. It's the other people that don't. Yes. And so I'm talking to people about how to be a good dad when it comes yeah. to jujitsu. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking to um, people about how they should respond because their kid got in trouble at school. And and I'm talking to people about coming to Bible study and yep. how yep. I'm talking to people who have made jujitsu an idol. And I'm telling them, like I did yesterday, if you die and all you have is jujitsu, you have nothing. You have nothing. Yeah. yeah. Life is more than jujitsu. That's, That's right. Life is more than a gold medal. Yeah. And believe me, I like gold medals as much right. as the next guy. <laughs> right. And you've won a lot of them. Yes, but at the I have to have more. Yeah, there's I'm not here on this earth just to have fun, and that's what jujitsu is for me. It's it's just fun. Yeah, it's a game. Yeah, yeah. I'm not here just to play games. Right. There has to be something that is going to go beyond the mat in this life. Right. And for me, uh, that's my understanding of of who I am and and what this world is and what God's plan is in this world. Yeah. And so I'm thinking like. All this time I've been asking myself, should I have left the ministry? Should I be a pastor? Should I? And all that, like in the last month or so, I think has come very clearly. I want you just where you are. And that's why I think you need to say, not you, but we need to say, my identity is not found in any of those things. Yeah. You, you and I both know pastors who their entire identity is found in that title and yes. that role. And the, the Bible elevates that role. Yes. I, I certainly would. Um, that the local church is a gift given to us by God. I elevate those things as scripture does. However, when you find your identity in a position on a church staff or anywhere else, you cease to be um, all that God would want you to be, wherever God would want you to be. And I think that's man, it's so important to say my identity right now is pastor. Yeah. And I'm going to do that. 110%, whatever God gives me, whatever God sets in front of me, I'm going to study and I'm going to pray and I'm going to preach. I'm going to do all that. But then if God sees fit to move me somewhere else, I'm not going to be so tied to that identity yeah. that I can't do the next thing because my identity is Christian, mm -hmm. which then also means, and it's exactly what you said, if I find myself in business because that's what God led me to do next or, you know, wherever it is, I never stop being a Christian. Yeah. Uh, people who... Maybe didn't follow our early podcast when we did the audio podcast. May not know uh, you. Those who listen to it certainly would. But uh, you really 
I say helped start that podcast. You were the impetus for us starting that podcast and your experience in that. And you gave us that platform. And, and, and at the time we had conversations. Why would we want a, a podcast? Why would we want to do that? It's because we're Christians. Yeah. And because as Christians, God can use us to communicate truth to other people, even people who wouldn't necessarily adopt our faith, mm -hmm. but they need direction yeah. and they need hope and they need those things. We can't, as you say, take that and just bury those those mm -hmm. things. Instead, trust God to to use those, which kind of takes us to the last part of this. Talk a minute for uh, about using your gifts uniquely, your talents, your abilities uniquely um, to minister to others and to serve others. I believe that I can't do everything or have the same gifts necessarily that other people do, but I'm not responsible for those either. I'm responsible for what God's given to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I, I think your identity is really also tied up in how you view yourself, right? Right. So it's right. not just how you want other people to view sure, you. Sure. Sure. But it's how you view yourself. True identity is what I view yes. yourself. Yes. I think that's probably even the root of it. I think that's right. right. Where we, what we project. That's yeah. right. What do I want to be? And uh, like I said, I was struggling with leaving the past pastoral ministry. And I got a lot of pushback on it from church members and from uh, other pastors yeah. and, and even some unbelievers that said like, hey, I thought, you know, you're a pastor. I thought that was like a lifelong vocation. Right, right. right. And so I really began to question that. Um, and, and for many, I think it is. Yeah. It's just that because of circumstances, things change. But what I do, I so the way I view myself now, let me just sum that up. Um, I view myself as a Christian businessman. And so I want to conduct myself mm. in a way that's graceful, yeah. that's, that's out of the ordinary. And so that kind of manifests itself in different ways, yeah. ways that I hadn't even considered. For example, a guy comes to me and says, uh, hey, Coach Gene, you know, I know I signed my daughter up for a year, and I know she got a, a, a gee, free gee and all that, mm. um, but she's got six months left, and she really doesn't like jujitsu anymore. <laughs> right. You know, a, a businessman, uh, any businessman, I think most businessmen would say, well, I'm sorry, we have a contract. Yeah, right. You know, maybe this right. is time to teach your daughter about commitment. And, sure. you know, you could justify it, even sure. from a Christian perspective. Sure, sure. But I said, you know, is she really done? Is she checked out? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay. Grace, cancel the contract. And he's like, really? Mm. You're not even going to charge me to get out of it? Mm. No. Yeah. Why not? I said, I said, because there'll be other kids signing up. It's sure. fine. Sure. You know, sure. and so the, the other beauty of my situation now is I didn't get into it because I'm trying to make money. You, you, know, so, you didn't need a job. No, yeah. I, I mean, I need money. Don't right. Get me wrong. Sure. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but it's not to be wealthy. Right. I'm not trying to get wealthy. Right. If I was trying to get wealthy, I'd definitely be doing something else. Sure. Um, so there's a freedom there. And he knows I'm, he, he doesn't go to church. He doesn't come to my Bible studies. Yeah. His other kids still trains, mm. but he knows like, this is kind of different, you know? Yeah. And just these little things, you know, when a, a kid misbehaves on the mat. Yeah. And just last week this happened. A parent came to me and said, I am so ashamed of what my son did. Mm. I said, don't be ashamed. It's not It's not a reflection on you. You can be the perfect parent right. in the world. Right. It doesn't matter. How do I know that? Because I have a rebellious son. Sure. So it, does, it, it doesn't right. happen. He's like, right. I'd really appreciate you telling me that. Yeah. You know? Right. And so just little Little things, um, a, a mom will bring her son to me and say, hey, I'm a single parent and my son is acting up, but he really loves jujitsu. How can we work together and, uh, and get him back on track? Yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's kind of mind blowing, just the different ways yeah. that, that, and then these people know. So when their life falls apart or when, you know, the doctor hands down the cancer diagnosis, mm. you know, I'm there. Yeah. I'm, I'm somebody they can talk to. Yep. I'm somebody that will pray for them. Yes. Um, somebody that can probably help them answer some questions they might, they yep. may have. And so I, I really enjoy that role. Yeah. And plus I love being around kids. I have five of my own grandkids in my program. That's awesome. Yeah. So look at, I, I get to go and practice jujitsu, which I really love yeah. and hang out with my grandkids yeah. and minister to other people. Right. And, and choke out some young guys in the process. <laughs> you know? Like what more could I ask right. for? Yeah, and if, if you're doing all of that right, then if God ever said, Gene, it's time to move into a new phase of life, 
you'd probably yeah. still do jujitsu, right? And, and I thought but you'd about be that. able to move into the next phase of life and say, well, then I'll just be what God wants me to be right there. I've thought about that. Yeah. I've thought about what, what would it be like to uh, go open a jujitsu school in Kenya, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then just use it as a ministry platform. Right. Right. Um, you know, let kids train for free and bring them in and have a Bible yeah. study. And, I yeah. mean, there's the, 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 in, the options are really endless. Yeah. So you can use that as a vehicle to reach people right. in a very organic way. As opposed to when I was a pastor, I was, you know, as much as we don't like to think of it this way, I'm in a professional position. Mm. I'm getting paid to sit here and listen to you. If you know that I'm not getting paid to sit here and listen to you, right. it usually carries a lot more weight yeah. in the relationship sure. than it does. Like if, well, this yeah. is, you know. People need to know you sincerely and I don't right. care about them. And I can, I can yeah. demonstrate that now. And by the way, when something becomes your job, whether it's a pastoral ship or a jiu-jitsu coach, mm. it kind of, it tends to take a little bit of the, the fun out of it, right? Because yeah, right. now it's under the category of work. You past, Pastoring is work. Yeah. And so a lot of times, I remember sitting in counseling sessions, not really wanting to be there. Right. You know, thinking like, is this really what I want? Like, is this really? <laughs> like so, right. but now um, it's different because, <laughs> yeah. I can, I can be brutally honest. I mean, I sure. could be brutally honest yeah. as a pastor. It's a different relationship. It's a different relationship. Yeah. I can tell them, look, if you don't like this school, there's more in town. Sure. You know, you couldn't say that about a church. Like, I mean, you could, <laughs> but it's probably not the most. Yeah. It's, thing it's to not say. the way they write about it. No. Yeah. So, um, it, it's very freeing for me and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And, uh, I look forward to what I even have thought, and this is going to sound crazy that, cause I don't even know if God still does this to some degree. Hmm. But I felt like he's given me success in this just for this reason. I go to a tournament sometimes like, Lord, am I going to win this just because you're like giving me a platform to use? Because mm. I'm not, I'm not a, I've never been an outstanding athlete. I've never been, you know, um, agile or flexible yep. or quick or yep. any of those things. But yet I've had a lot of success in jiu-jitsu. And I've often wondered like, is all of this success just so God can bring me to this place mm -hmm. where he's using me in this capacity? And I think to some degree, there's some truth in that. I think as a Christian, you have to look at any platform God gives you as yeah. for him and not for us. Yeah. And that's where we get backwards. It's awesome. Thank you, Gene. I appreciate you uh, talking. We'll do Thanks it again. Me. Okay. Certainly. Great. Thank you. Thank you for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Don't forget, we have this show every single week and we'll have great guests on every week and appreciate you checking in. If you haven't already, go to uh, that uh, subscribe link, hit that, hit the bell. It'll let you know we have a new episode up. We'll see you next time.